Professor Anil Suklal, thank you so much for your time, especially given everything that you are, are preparing for next week. I want to start with these comments that you made uh, to my colleague. You said it's an unfortunate narrative that BRICS uh, has been, people have been talking about BRICS as being anti-West. Where do you think that narrative has come from and, and is there any merit to it? Well, look, in the public domain, a number of, of writers have been characterizing uh, BRICS as being anti-West, as a coalition against uh, the G7, and it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate because BRICS has never been created as a block against any other entity. It's not in competition with any other existing multilateral forum. And BRICS came together to look how we can work collectively in terms of the shared values we have in reshaping the current global architecture, taking the interests of the global south uh, and projecting them as part of creating a more inclusive, representative and fair multipolar world. But, but given the events of the past year or so, I mean, is it fair that some people have characterized this, this body as potentially being one that is trying to counter the G7 and others? No, I think, I think what you have seen is the visibility of BRICS mm. uh, far more on the global stage for a number of reasons. Mm. Uh, one of which has been on the issue of, of uh, Russia and South Africa hosting the summit and the ICC arrest warrant that has brought undue attention on the challenges it posed for South Africa. And we have dealt with that in a manner that I think uh, all of our BRICS partners, including Russia, is quite satisfied. And I think Rep. President Ramaphosa has done a good job through a consultative process with all BRICS partners to find a solution. Uh, that does not detract from the summit. Secondly, I think the factor that has brought sharp focus on BRICS has been the issue of expansion. And uh, the large number of countries, uh, major emerging market developing countries, that have collectively uh, approached BRICS to become full members. So I think this has also brought a major focus on BRICS. Right, and I want to talk about that because you are one of the few people who are in the room really deciding what this criteria is going to be for potential expansion. Mm -hmm. You talked about how it's still a work in progress a few days out from BRICS. Where, where is there a consensus right now and where are there still wide gulfs between the BRICS nations? Well, we almost have convergence and consensus on the four areas that leaders task shape us to look at, and that is guiding principles, standard criteria, and procedure for expansion and models of expansion. All of that is more or less in place. Uh, it's a bit more work to do on some of the, the provisions on the uh, criteria. Talk about that. What, what, what is still outstanding there? Well, there's one or two areas where we, we don't have convergence in terms of the global multilateral architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, where, as you know, uh, this is a complex issue. And I'm confident that we'll find convergence and that this uh, exercise will be completed in time for our foreign ministers to meet later this week and to make firm recommendations on expansion to the leaders. Uh, there is an expectation that the leaders will make pronouncement on expansion. This is on the agenda in terms of, of their discussions. And I'm sure there will be some pronouncement on this issue. Based on what you've heard and what you've seen, are there can you give us any insight into whether or not we'll see a few different countries potentially uh, added to BRICS, or is it just more of an agreement of heads of state that expansion should happen? I mean, that happened last year, right, in, in China. So, so what? what? No, last what year in China, what happened was they gave directive that we need to start discussing mm -hmm. expansion and work out the criteria and so forth. That's what we were tasked to do, and that's where it stopped. But uh, as part of the mandate, the foreign ministers asked us to expand and look at modalities for expansion, which we have done. And that's on the table at the moment. But it's the leader's decision on, on the type of expansion and the number of countries should we decide to expand. That will be determined at summit. What type of expansion in your mind would be beneficial to BRICS countries? And I'm thinking of specific countries that have been rumored to have asked, or not rumored, reported, Saudi Arabia, Iran, the UAE. I mean, what if those countries were a part of BRICS, what benefit would that give? 
Surprise. Well, that's one of the uh, issues we have discussed under guiding principles and criteria and so forth. BRICS has established itself on the global front as a major body of the global south and the values that we espouse and the principles that we, we have been championing in terms of advancing the agenda of the global south, including the African agenda. So if we do decide to expand, whichever country does become a member must uh, subscribe to these values and principles that BRICS has been championing and will continue to champion. How much are you looking at other international multilateral bodies to sort of form the basis of what it is that you're looking at? Well, we do. We do uh, look at other models and see are there any best practices that we can draw on in guiding us. Because as you know, this would be the second expansion of BRICS. The first was South Africa's admittance, and that was quite straightforward. But now, given the large number of countries that have asked to join, it's incumbent on us to have some procedures in place so that this process of expansion, there's some logic to it on how we go about. Is there concern that you could potentially, you know, go down a path that could perhaps heighten tensions, geopolitical tensions that are already heightened at this point in time? I mean, how much is that a factor of the conversations you're having? I think, I think it's very important you have a body from the Global South championing issues of the Global South collectively uh, in terms of, of working together with all global partners in addressing the fault lines that exist, the outdated structures that we have in terms of the geopolitical, financial, economic architecture. And I think a, a, the only time you will see change when you have a powerful force uh, working towards that change, uh, working independently as individual countries, you're not going to have that gravity. But BRICS has created gravity around itself, and I believe if it does expand, and which is highly likely, that gravity is going to become even heavier. And I think you cannot ignore the principles we are championing to create a multipolar world, a multi-civilizational world, multicultural world, and an inclusive world where no one is really left behind. And part of that, too, and a lot of the discussion has been around moving away from a focus on the dollar, a dollar-centric world. I've seen you talk about that before. Outside of a countries, a BRICS countries trading in their local currencies, I mean, are there other alternatives that are being discussed when you talk about expansion, when you talk about sort of what the, the formation of BRICS should be? I mean, what is the discussion there? Well, look, if you look at the global trading architecture, it's a multipolar trading architecture today. Mm -hmm unlike a few decades ago where it was dominated by a few countries. Countries of the Global South are major shareholders in global trade today. The USA's share of global trade has diminished dramatically from the 70s and so forth. And yet, over 50% of global trade is invoiced in the dollar. And that is why countries from the Global South, uh, including BRICS countries, are saying that we, we need to expand our trade, our payment settlement system, the manner in which we conduct our, our financial transactions, deepening use of local currencies. It's not about de-dollarization. I think this is a natural development where countries are looking to greater financial flexibility, greater financial aut autonomy, and having greater choices in terms of how they conduct themselves on the global economic financial front. Is that sentiment shared amongst other Sherpas? Very much so, very much so. That's why what is on the agenda is not de-dollarization, but deepening interaction in local currencies. That is what our BRICS leaders are going to be talking about. Where do you see the most tension at, at this point in time uh, with a few days to go to BRICS? Well, we don't really have tension points, but uh, I mean, Look, there are differences of opinion in terms of some of the, the, the global uh, multilateral challenges we have, in terms of some of the global uh, hotspots and how we deal with this as a collective, in terms of... Conflicts, you mean? Yes, conflicts, okay. in terms of, of uh, some of the new areas that we are seeking cooperation on in areas of... Uh, cyber security in areas of uh, how we uh, look at e-commerce and the disproportionate, disproportionate balance of how e-commerce trade is at the moment. Africa's share is like two and a half percent. So we are saying that uh, trade imbalance between uh, BRICS countries, our trade with BRICS countries has grown substantially. It's over 800. 
30 billion, but the balance of trade is, is not in our favor. So for South Africa and for the African continent, we need to change this in terms of becoming more balanced and working also in our favor. Is food security part of the negotiations as well? Because, uh, of course, I mean, we saw Russia pull out of the grain sea, uh, Black Sea grain deal, and a number of African countries, especially here in South Africa, were concerned about that. I mean, how much is that going to be a part That's of the discussion? That's going to be addressed very sharply by the African leaders, together with the BRICS leaders, because it's impacting very negatively on the African continent. Our president raised this, right. both with President Zelensky and President Putin, during his recent visit to both countries. African leaders have raised it uh, directly with, with both these countries. And given the fact that all of the African leaders are going to be here, together the BRICS leaders, uh, this is going to be high on the agenda. What, what, what can we anticipate, though? Will there be a resolution to it? Or? I'm sure we'll find a favorable consideration of, of the negative impact this is having on the African continent. Mm. And, and, and it, do, do the Russians agree with that as well? I'm sure you will also see Russia favorably considering the request from African countries in terms of fertilizer, in terms of food security. I'm confident. And, yes. and finest, finally, Prof, uh, in terms of a successful summit, because you, you know we a lot of times we see these these gatherings of, of multilateral uh, countries, and and it's it's a communique or it's you know it's a lot of talk and not a lot of action. I mean, what what action, especially as somebody who's been in the room for a number of years, what action will actually are you expecting to come from this summit next week? Well, we have identified a number of tangibles. Look, the fact of the matter, we're having the business forum that's right. bringing together not only the, the private sector from the f five BRICS countries, but a large number of African countries and countries from the global south are all going to be here together. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to provide a platform for real uh, transactional-based uh, agreements taking place. We are very confident of that. Mm -hmm. And there's two major platforms. You have the very dedicated Women's Business Alliance meeting in Durban over two days, right. over a thousand delegates, over 20 African countries, various other countries, and they're going to launch the Women's Business Alliance Africa uh, virtual trade platform. So right. that's going to be a very tangible platform to, to for our, especially women in business, SMME sector, mm -hmm. to conduct business. Already we have had uh, the meeting of our think tank and academic forum, right. joint research, exchange between our students, universities, all of that is happening. So at the ground level, there are a number of tangible deliverables that impacts directly on the quality of life of our people. Are you anticipating any blowback, potentially, or negative reaction from the West in particular based on BRICS's stance on a number of countries? China specifically. I know you've talked about uh, China and Huawei, uh, Iran potentially. I mean, are you anticipating anything? No, no, North? I don't think so. I think our partners from the Global North fully understand mm. that uh, we have very strong relations with them. We respect those relations and we continue to grow it. And so do we have relations with BRICS and other countries of the Global South and the African continent. This is the diversity of South Africa's interaction with the global community. We don't play one country against the other or one region against the other. All of this is important, not just for South Africa, but the African continent. But what we are saying to our BRICS partners and our partners in the North, mm -hmm. let's work in collaboration with each other rather than in competition with each other mm -hmm. that, to the detriment of, of our South Africa and the continent. Finally. Is that possible? Do you think that is possible? Very much possible. We have got our BRICS countries. We speak very frankly with them to understand some of the challenges we face in terms of trading patterns. Uh, we don't want a repetition of, of trading patterns of, of the past. Uh, they are new entrants into our economies, uh, and we want them to do things differently. And we're saying the same. We're diversifying our trade basket with our interaction with the global north, it has to be the same with, with BRICS. We don't have two standards in terms of how we conduct our, our business and our foreign relations with the world. Professor Suklal, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.